Uh, welcome on behalf of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute. My name is Vera Grant, director of the new Cooper Gallery. And here, here. And um, I'm so delighted, those of you who are here for the second day and those of you just joining us for the Elaine Locke Lecture Series uh, we have today and then one more lecture tomorrow in this wonderful series. Um, we are delighted to uh, have Professor Suzanne Blier, who is the Alan Whittle Close Professor of Fine Arts and the Professor of African and African American Studies here at Harvard University to introduce Holland Carter today. Thank you. Thank you. And it gives me just a great honor to be here to introduce to you Holland Carter. Uh, he's a man who really needs no introductions, and if you were here yesterday, you heard uh, a, a brief overview of some of his um, enormous um, uh, number of prizes and his history. I'll simply go through them briefly uh, and then uh, add another piece to it. Since 1998, he's been the co-chief art critic and senior writer for the New York Times. Since he began writing for uh, criticism for the New York Times in 1998, from, for many of us who work in the field of African and African di diasporic arts, uh, a sort of light went on at the Times and we began to see art criticism and the engagement with museum exhibits in an entirely new way. It, it was just astonishing, the impact that he had on the way that we began uh, to see the world of art in these other areas and the way that um, he really privileged these at the New York Times in ways which celebrated their um, art, artistic richness, but also the intellectual underpinnings associated with them. In 2007, when the Arts Council of the African Studies Association met at Harvard, uh, he gave the keynote address uh, because uh, we all acknowledged what an absolutely transformative role he'd played uh, in the understanding of African art more broadly. In 2009, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism. In 2010, the Lifetime Achievement Award for Art Writing uh, in the, by the College Art Association. When I listened to his talk yesterday, um, I realized in many respects that there, there's a term in art history for skeomorphs, which is to say one object which is created in a different medium. And I realized yesterday that he was speaking that I was actually reading in my mind as he was talking and wanting him to slow down for some cases 20 or 30 seconds so I could savor the words that you can do when you're reading somebody you know, through their lines. In the same sense, when I read him in print, I often hear his voice and hear the silences that he's bringing to bear. He really transforms the way we see art not only by his thinking, not only by his hand, but also by the extraordinarily powerful and beautiful way in which he s expresses these ideas in print. As he mentioned yesterday, he comes to this and encourages all of us to come to these issues with real passion, with a sense of search, of hunger. He's a peripatetic individual in that sense of looking for, seeking to find insight and challenging himself and us to look at things in a new way. The subject of this afternoon's talk the Universal Museum with Missing Parts, in the Universal Museum with Missing Parts, to me says so much, even in the title. Sometimes titles do that. And I won't preempt what he's going to say, except that it's extraordinarily important for all of us, and particularly at this point in time. I think it's wonderfully timed and coordinated that the Du Bois has invited him to give the Alain Locke lectures. Uh, in part because of the critical role that Alain Locke played in understanding and promoting the critical importance of art. I'm going to move slightly to the side to mention something that happened a, a while ago here in this uh, Department of African and African American Studies. I remember being in the Thompson Room upstairs, and at the front of the long seminar table were William Julius Wilson, uh, who had um, a while earlier published his famous work, The Declining Import Significance of Race, 
And Cornell West, who just came out with a new book called Race Matters. Henry Louis Gates had positioned them together, uh, key individuals, brilliant thinkers, in part because they came at the issue of race from two very different vantage points. And that discussion was one of the most amazing that I've ever had here at Harvard. Race matters, insists Cornell West. So does art, art matters. It's not just beautiful objects, it's where they're positioned, it's how they're shown, and um, this is emotional. Holland Cotter has really transformed the way we think about this. In his February 14th, which is Valentine's Day, 2013 review of an exhibition looking back at two decades at the New Museum, he writes, history is written by the winners, which in contemporary art means the market. It's often also written by the people who weren't on the scene and have to take the winner's word for what happened and what mattered. And he is doing that for us. Let me just end by what a great context this is. We never get to really see these works. Here we've got Theodore Roosevelt, usually covered with the um, uh, screen, and uh, this is a painting by Joseph de Camp, 1908. Uh, uh, um, Roosevelt, well known, not only as an aristocrat and Harvard uh, alum, but also for uh, the Rough Riders, for Cuba, for the Wild West. Uh, he was a figure even then at the 1893 Columbian Exposition when so many of the issues about museums and separation and what's included and what's excluded begin to take shape. The West, the native, the other. And on my left, uh, your right, is Frank Elwell's Kronos, or Time, from 1901 that was exhibited at the Pan American Exposition of Buffalo. I came in before the lecture just to look at it. Uh, a veiled face, it's supposed to evoke the idea of fast time and slow time, or the progress of time, or the lack of progress of time. When I see it, I see a Native American, an Iroquois, on a, uh, a tortoise, a turtle, which is the symbol of creation. Institution and globalization, the museum and the artist, the construction of identity, self and the other. These are things which Holland Cotter has really transformed in the view of many of us and the world at large. He is an everyman. On Facebook, when I posted the lecture, somebody said, with his photograph, somebody said, oh my God, I thought he was a young black dude. <laughs> and he is, he's every man and every person. Uh, he's a chimera in every sense of the word and I'm so looking forward to his talk on the universe, in the Universal Museum with Missing Parts. So let's welcome Holland Cotter. Thank you. Thanks very much, I'm really glad to be here. I've disappointed people like that before, too. They think I'm like six feet four and I don't know what, but uh, anyway. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, hello and uh, welcome back to this uh, second talk in a series of three. Thanks for coming back if you're back and welcome if you're coming for the first time. Yesterday, I gave a brief uh, account of my personal experience of growing up in America, which was also African America in the 1950s and 60s, specifically in and around the Boston area. I spoke of the music I heard as a child in a jazz-loving home, of a bus trip I made through the South when I was 17, of the first course I took uh, upon entering as a freshman English major here at Harvard in 1966. The course was called Primitive Art. Of my post-Harvard career as an art journalist, and I also spoke of my return to school in the 1980s as a graduate student in art history. I ended yesterday by saying that although graduate work was, my graduate work was in Asian art, African art was increasingly on my mind in the, eight, in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. largely because um, the field at that time was generating exceptionally daring and stimulating museum work and scholarship. Actually, the very fact that African art was showing up at all on a permanent footing in encyclopedic museums 
was a novel development still. As I noted yesterday, there was no permanent display of African material at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts when I was a young person. I missed the MFA's first major exhibition of African, Oceanic, and America's material in 1958, although I was going to the museum regularly at that time. It was called Masterpieces of Primitive Art, and I missed it possibly because the show only lasted for five weeks. By the time the next, I, similar show came, it was an all-African show in this case, it was 33 years later, and I was in that time in New York City. Uh, clearly, the MFA, like many other American museums, does not have a distinguished and enlightened history in exhibiting the art of Africa. But while it's easy to be dismissive of such blind spots in our cultural institutions, it's also worth noting that the basic concepts and values on which the standard Western Universal Museum was built are fundamentally at odds with environments from which most tradition-based African visual arts emerged. Working with an elaborate and particular system of aesthetics, Western art museums judged objects primarily by fine points of appearance rather than by use. Indeed, the less obviously functional an object was, the greater its aesthetic worth was considered to be. Within this value system, forms were hierarchically stacked with painting and sculpture at the top. And this vertical monument was crowned by the unique masterpiece produced by the artist's genius. Africa operated, uh, African art operated on almost an opposite principle. No single medium was privileged. Beadwork, textiles, ceramics, basketry, and sculpture had equivalent status, rising or falling depending on the context. Aesthetic considerations were certainly a factor in African art production, but social, religious, and political concerns also shaped design. As for the artist's genius paradigm, unusually gifted artists were certainly renowned and esteemed within African communities. But when, uh, when Ar African objects were collected during the colonial era and sent abroad, the names of artists were not recorded. As far as we knew, these objects came out of an anonymous nowhere. Africa had no Praxiteles, no Leonardos, no Rodin. It didn't even have individuals, or at least individuals capable of aesthetic discrimination. It says something about the continuing flaw of an aesthetic system built on, cos on connoisseur connoisseurship alone that when, in the late 1990s, the Metropolitan Museum, the Metropolitan Museum's Acquisitions Committee was presented with a request, a departmental request, to purchase a magnificent illuminated Ethiopian gospel, members of the committee barked. They thought they were looking at folk art, not fine art. The museum's African art curator had to argue strenuously that no, the gospel was not folk art. It was a collaborative production of one of the great monastic scriptoria of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Committee members were simply unfamiliar with Ethiopian art, which until then had been almost absent from the collection, and which doesn't conform to the expected look of African art. They didn't know what they were seeing. Unfamiliarity, as we learn again and again in history of museums, can breed contempt. The, the gospel, they did finally purchase the gospel. The, the curator was successful in persuading them that in fact they should buy this book, and they bought the book. Despite its prejudices and strictures, it was the art museum as an institution that ultimately shaped the acceptance of African art in both the academic and public realms, transformed fetishes into sculptures. Though the transformation in identity and value was slow and roundabout. For a long time, even when museums treated African art as art, it was art from a different, different from other art. The Art Institute of Chicago first collected African art in the mid-20s as part of its children's museum. The Cleveland Museum acquired its earliest African objects under the auspices of its Department of Education and Public Programs. Both the, both the Brooklyn Museum and the Cincinnati Museum, 
which was self-advertised as the art palace of the West, but brought African art in through their departments of ethnology. In general, the acquisition of African art was justified as part of an institution's educational and civic mission, rather than on grounds of art aesthetic worth. African art wasn't necessarily good, but knowing of its existence was good for you, if only to demonstrate the superiority of Western art more clearly. And when special departments were instituted to handle African material, they usually took the form of primitivist, primitivist catch-alls. The title of the METS Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas preserves a multitasking model still prevalent in American museums. It's also worth noting that the model also ap applies to teaching. Until fairly recently, and in some places this is probably still true, anyone who taught African art at the college level was also expected to be able to teach other primitive areas, all other primitive areas. When I was a grad student at Columbia in the early 1990s, the department's reigning modernist no one would have thought to say Western modernist, taught Western European art with a smidge of American thrown in, made between 1850 and 1950, period. The professor of South Asian art taught the arts, plural, of India, the Himalayas, including Nepal and Tibet, and Southeast, and Southeast Asian art, covering a chronological range from roughly 2300 BC to 1800 AD. The recent explosion of interest among students in South Asian contemporary art, art has further widened the ocean of knowledge that this teacher must navigate and command. Even when African art was finally accepted into museums on aesthetic grounds, admission was tightly regulated and edited. Only museum-worthy material was permitted, meaning art that resembled or complemented or enhanced the status of Western art, specifically Western modern art. The first exhibition in the United States to present African objects as, as art was Alfred Stieglitz's uh, uh, 291 gallery in New York City, a space known primarily for promoting leading-edge modernism. The modernism was the pretext for exhibiting African material at that gallery. The show's title made this clear. Statuary in Wood by African Savages, the root of modern art. Stieglitz started a trend. Albert Barnes picked, it up, picked up on it in 1924 when he installed his African collection among his Renoirs and Matisses, creating the first permanent American display of African art as art in his museum which was also his home in Marion, Pennsylvania. And it should have stayed in Marion, Pennsylvania. <laughs> the watershed event in this domestication and aestheticization, aestheticization of African objects came in 1935 with the Museum of Modern Arts exhibition, African Negro Art, in 1935. A major event that put African art on the popular map by simultaneously broadening and narrowing its appeal. The show included textiles, jewelry, furniture, and other utilitarian objects that up until that time were unwelcome in art museums. So that was good. But it also consolidated the trend to narrow down the styles of African art to be seen as desirable, namely highly abstract figurative sculptures of a sort that might look at home when set beside a Brancusi. African forms, in other words, that worked in the MoMA setting. That setting was carefully calculated. The curator, James Johnson Sweeney, isolated the African sculptures in a white box space, devoid of any explanatory labels. He avoided, in other words, any hint of an African context any suggestion that this sculpture <clears throat> had specific functions or meanings beyond what you see is what you get. Sweeney wrote that, that his intention was to give, quote, the art of Negro Africa its place of respect among the aesthetic traditions of the world, end quote. What he didn't say was that, res 
that was that that respect was being extended entirely on the Western world's terms. The idea that African art was, and always has been, modern on its own terms, innovative in function, locally stylish, intellectually progressive, always riffing on tradition without being trapped in it, in touch with the past but constantly changing, was not part of the sales pitch. Exhibitions can create a market, and the MoMA show did. Private collections of African art began to proliferate in the United States, and collectors were after what MoMA had canonized, wood-carved figures and masks with clean lines and smooth, glossy surfaces. This was the right African art, the classy, clubbable stuff. Paradoxically, authenticity was considered a sine qua non, a value. You wanted objects that had been made for and preferably used within a traditional setting. At the same time, attached materials that might have indicated active use, such as vegetable fibers, earth, or other organic substances, everything that originally made the object alive were stripped away to keep the sculptural lines clean. The 1935 MoMA look, look is still reflected in museum holdings today, most of which are built on private collections dating back to mid-century or earlier. It's only very recently that once non-canonical art, like South African beadwork, came into the Metropolitan Museum's collection I remember spotting a little cluster of it one, on one visit, this is about maybe 10 years ago, that it hadn't been there before, and I think it had only come because for a very brief time in New York City, there was a gallery called Axis Gallery devoted to South African art. So the art was there to be seen, it had a presence. The Met saw it and bought it. The gallery is now gone. Invisibility can, uh, visibility can mean everything, and, and invisibility can mean everything, too. One collector heavily influenced by Sweeney's art for art's sake approach was Nelson Rockefeller, who opened his own museum, the Museum of Primitive Art, across the street behind MoMA in 1957, the year that the first PhD in African art as a standalone academic field was granted to Roy Sieber, at the University of Iowa. Beginning in the 1960s, the visibility of an art that had once only floated at the fringes of art museums began to build. More scholars began to enter the field of African art history, many of them veterans of the Peace Corps, returning home from Africa with love and excitement in their eyes. As African countries gained independence, the market changed, opened up, with new kinds of material becoming available, which in turn spawned more collecting. And importantly, with the burgeoning of black consciousness and the black power movement, political pressure was on to give Africa a prominent place in the American cultural mainstream. In 1978, Rockefeller's Museum of Primitive Art transferred its collections to the Metropolitan Museum. And the country's, in 1982, the country's grandest universal art museum opened its Michael C. Rockefeller wing of primitive art. It's no longer called of primitive art, it's now just the Michael C. Rockefeller wing. Five years later, in 1987, another Smithsonian, um, under the Smithsonian umbrella, the National Museum of African Art opened on the mall in Washington, or just off it, as the first American public museum dedicated solely to the art of Africa. So the 1980s, in the 1980s, along a big piece of sculpture, a big piece of sculpture, a big piece of art and culture, uh, had technically found a slot in the Universal Museum, though hardly a neutral slot. And with the stimulating winds of multiculturalism blowing, certain art thinkers were taking a critical look at how the, the now institutionalized African art was being viewed and suggesting that its identity and meanings 
were being misunderstood, misrepresented, and distorted within a museum setting. I was just coming onto the scene around this time, a novice writer, and I arrived just in time to witness a fabulous scandal. In 1984, October 1984, the Museum of Modern Art opened a huge exhibition called Primitivism in 20th Century Art, Affinity of the Tribal and the Modern. The museum had been very careful to put primitivism in quotes, which was designed, according to its press release, to, quote, examine the crucial influence of the tribal arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americans on modern painters and sculptors, end quote, and to illuminate, quote, the problems of influence and rapport, end quote. The personnel involved were most impressive. The principal organizer was William S. Rubin, director of the museum's Department of Painting and Sculpture, who was a very big deal in the world of modernist scholarship. He was assisted by Kirk Varnado, who would become his successor, and another big deal. The show had lots of loans, cost a bundle to do, and was installed in prime MoMA real estate. The two-volume catalog included essays by Rubin himself, Jack Flam, and Rosalind E. Krauss, all modernist heavyweights. The critical reception was positive at first, until an, essay, until an essay-length review by the, a critic named Thomas McEvely, Thomas McEvely, appeared in the November issue of Art Forum. Titled, Doctor, Lawyer, Indian Chief, the review carefully logically, passionately, and thoroughly demolished the show. Beginning with its basic unstated curatorial assumption, which was that the indigenous arts of Africa, Asia, Australia, Oceania, and the Americas were of value primarily as source material for and footnotes to Western modernism. McEvely pointed out that as presented by the exhibition, the quote affinity of the title along with the rapport of the press release, went strictly in one direction. The art of Africa, Oceania, and Amer Native America was frozen in time by, this, by the view the museum gave it. Static. Modernism, by contrast, was dynamic, progressive, changing, willing to take on new ideas. Tribal objects had yet again been assigned the status of ethnological specimens. Rubin and Varnado tried to rebut the attack in open letters to Art Forum, only to have McEvely come back with even more persuasively damning arguments. He clearly relished the opportunity to extend his critique in powerfully accessible language, a very important fact that he wrote in very accessible language. Everybody could read him. Uh, he clearly relished the opportunity to extend his critique to the reductive thinking and racial exclusions of the museum itself. He went beyond the show. He said MoMA was in trouble. The culture was in trouble. Including uh, blinkered Western art scholarship. <laughs> when the dust had settled, there was no question who the winner was. And with a new era of thinking about art had begun. Specifically, art and its institutions were under scrutiny. I remember this time so vivid, reading those articles, one after the other after the other, and you just couldn't believe. Kirk wrote the first letter, then Bill wrote the next one, and you just couldn't believe they, they were asking for it. You know, it's like a kick me on their back. It was great. <laughs> it was just great. It's very exciting. I want to stay with Tom uh, McEvely for, for a moment. Um, he died recently um, uh, at 73. Uh, after he, he had a rough time at the end of his life. Um, he, and he's somebody worth knowing about. Um, his intellectual and professional background made him extremely well suited to be a spokesperson for uh, expansive ways of looking at the art world. With a doctorate in classical philology and a command of classical Greek and Sanskrit, he had been teaching courses in Greek in ancient Greek and Indian culture, South Asian Indian culture, at Rice University in Houston for almost 20 years, as well as courses in religion and philosophy. But he also kept in touch with a group of globally-minded contemporary artists who in, uh, he was married to one, in fact, 
um, who in the early 1980s spurred him to write a new art. In the long lingering wake of 1960s formalist thinking, dominated by Clement Greenberg and minimalism, Tom was a strong and persistent alternative voice. When, for example, confronted with the myth that abstraction was a European invention, he knew enough, he had looked at enough, to point to a wide range of non-Western art, from Hindu tantric painting to African masks to Islamic tile work to demonstrate otherwise. He was among the first American art critics of his generation to write extensively about contemporary non-Western art, which was all but unknown by the Western market. And I really liked his critical method. In place of two commonly preferred modes of art criticism, descriptive consumer reporting on the one hand and theoretical straitjacketing on the other, he followed a middle route. When dealing with unfamiliar, long invisible art, he took his job to be introductory and interpretive. He avoided thumbs up, thumbs down judgments, the standard posture of authoritative criticism, in favor of laying out the cultural contexts in which, in which such judgments might legitimately be made. And in the end, he made his insistent overarching criticism of Western institutional blindness clear less through his words than through his choice of the art he wrote about, much of it understudied, misunderstood, or ignored. McEvely's review of MoMA's primitivism and his thinking, and the thinking his review sparked, had, a, had long range effects on, on me, among many other people, um, which we're still feeling. He was a power of example to me, I really liked him. Um, among other things, he inspired the French curator Jean Hubert Martin to assemble in 1989 one of the first truly international exhibitions of contemporary art, Magicians of the Earth in Paris, which included artists from five continents, I met Martin said he actually what he did was inspired by, by Tom's writing, which is wonderful. Um, this exhibition, in turn, set the model for countless other shows, including virtually every biennial and triennial over the past 30 years, whether in Venice, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, or Dakar. The Magicians of the Earth had its own primitivizing issues, as, of course, do these biennials. But that they provided the material to raise such issues was crucial. You can't talk about art unless you know it exists. And suddenly we had a lot more art to talk about. Did MoMA change its tune after its public rebuke? Absolutely not. <laughs> and I'll get to that. Like all our big mainstream museums, it is a profoundly conservative institution to its roots. The place to look for experimentation was elsewhere, on the fringes. And as it happened, a new fringe museum opened its doors in the very year primitivism appeared, 1984. It was then called the Center for African Art and founded by the art historian Susan Vogel, a former curator at the Nelson Rockefeller Museum of Primitive Art and then at the Met. The Center for African Art began in a rented Upper East Side townhouse with a very specific goal of casting a self-reflexive light on the collecting and exhibiting of African and by, all extension, by extension all non-Western art. Some of his early shows were fairly straightforward loan shows, collection shows. Others were like no, nothing anybody had ever attempted. In its groundbreaking 1988 show called Art Slash Artifact, the museum presented, quote, classical African objects in four different simulated environments, a cabinet of curiosities, an ethnographic diorama, a standard under plexiglass art museum display, and a commercial art gallery display, all to underscore, as Susan Vogel wrote, the extent to which the way we see art is conditioned by how we're shown it. The exhibition Africa Explores in 1991 was one of the very first surveys of a wide range of contemporary African art 
still virtually unknown in New York, and not only unknown, but not even suspected. Anina Nose in Soho, it was a private gal, she was an Italian dealer with a private gallery in Soho. Anina Nose in Soho had shown an artist named Sherry Samba, a painter, a painter from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but that was about it. Africa Explores pulled together an amazing wide, formal, and conceptual range of work, including academic painting, portrait photography, glass painting, shop signs, textiles, Mercedes-Benz-shaped coffins, classical masks, and spectacular riffs and updates on, the, on those masks. The show made clear that contemporary art in Africa did not necessarily represent a break with traditional art, but often operated on a continuum with it. This was a very important point to make at, in light of the knee-jerk accusations of inauthenticity that were directed at contemporary African art by certain collectors and scholars within the African field at that time. I've seen exactly the same divide in the field of Asian studies. When Asia Society presented its show, Inside Out, New Chinese Art, in 1998, a show that put the contemporary art, the contemporary, that put contemporary Chinese work on the international map, curators of the Metropolitan Museum in the Asian department there didn't bother to see the show, which is 10 blocks away. Now they regret it, of course, because it, contemporary art's coming into museum collections, into their collection as well. So they're, anyway. <laughs> Vogel intended to be provocative, and she was. She took some serious critical heat, critical heat for that show, which she had, she had assembled pretty much single-handedly. She was accused of giving a skewed view of new African art, one that included too many self-taught or workshop-trained artists, and that failed to take into account artists, many of them living outside the continent, who were working in international styles and were making an effort to steer clear of exoting, exoticizing Africanness. And there were specific errors of omission. A number of studio portrait f photographs from Mali in the show were, in tr were attributed to unknown photographer unknown. But they were, in fact, by Sedu Keita, who was widely known and still working in Bamako at that time and would very soon after this become an international star. Critics of the show said that the failure to acknowledge him was evidence of the show's drive-by take on its subject, its indulgence in, quote, postmodern primitivism, end quote. Vogel herself later conceded that the days of the single-authored show on that scale and breadth were probably over. I covered the show for Art in America. <clears throat> I wasn't writing for the Times yet. I was still a late-in-life graduate student. At Columbia, early in 1991, I had, been, I had been having conversations about art with a South Asian colleague in a Sanskrit class. One day when I mentioned a budding curiosity about Indian contemporary art, she said emphatically, there is no contemporary art in India. I would come to hear that opinion expressed often. The same year when I met with a member of my orals committee for the first time, and threw out the idea of doing a dissertation. I just threw it out, I was almost kidding. On new art in India, she made it clear that she regarded the idea as at best whimsical and at worst a cop-out, as if I was trying to get away with something. So I was really ready for Africa Explorers when it came, and it didn't disappoint me. It was my introduction to new art that I was, I was for, <laughs> sight unseen and that I found fascinating and exhilarating. I must say in long retrospect, having been to Africa since, the mix that Vogel put together for that show makes more sense to me than ever. Was it all great art? No. But it caught the vitality of art as a happening phenomenon, a now in progress. But what was for me the museum's most radical exhibition came two years later. It was called Face of the Gods, Art and Altars of Africa and the African Americas, and organized by Robert, Robert Ferris Thompson, he of the 1966 PhD, who began his career 
1966 being the year I was in that primitivism class down the street here. <laughs> he began his career studying uh, Yoruba cultures in Nigeria and continued in expanding that into researching the African diaspora to the Americas in forms ranging from syncretic religions in the Caribbean to hip hop culture. His show was made up of two dozen or so altars from various centers of Afro-Atlantic worship. Some were historical objects in the traditional sense, shipped from a place of origin and later returned. Other altars in the show were commissioned from ritual practitioners who created and consecrated them in the museum specifically for the show, then ritually dismantled them. And in fact, they wouldn't, do the, they agreed, they wouldn't agree to do the altars unless they were permitted to consecrate them. That was uh, part of the deal. The third category consisted of recreations of untransportable altars, such as sand altars to the goddess of the sea on Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro, reconstructed by the museum's design team from photographs and constructed in theater-style sets uh, of the kind you find in natural history museums. So this particular altar to the sea goddess was candles and flowers and bottles of champagne in a, in a field of sand and set in a curving uh, nighttime blue uh, diorama. Very beautiful. So the fine art versus ethnology divide that, divided, that defined museums of my youth was erased. And that erasure in the world of large museums like the Met raises all kinds of unresolved aesthetic issues and ethical issues about authenticity, about art and sacredness, about the possibility of religious worship within a museum context. I've been told that the Met guards at the Cloisters, which is the, uh, at the uptown branch of the Met, which has this me medieval collection, that the guards there are given special instructions on how to intervene in the event that visitors try to worship there. Was Face of the Gods a success? For me, absolutely. It did a lot to change my already changing ideas of what a museum could be and do. The proof of its effectiveness was in the audience it was pulling. People came who had never been to a museum before because they heard about the live altars. Devotees of African Caribbean Santeria and Afro Brazilian Condomble left coins and fruit and offered prayers and songs. For anyone who's been to a temple museum in India or Japan, the phenomenon was familiar. But for Western art museums, visit, Western art museum visitors, it was virtually unheard of. And it's interesting to talk to the people involved in that time of how you negotiated this with security and very, very interesting, wonderful. You know, the contact between the audience and, and museum personnel became intense and daily and uh, lots of negotiation going on. Other exhibitions in and around this time similarly broke with conventional museum models of arts fixity. As early as 1988, monks from Tibet were creating and, and ritually destroying a Kala Chakra, or Wheel of Time sand mandala at the Museum of Natural History. They repeated this many times since then, but that was the first time they did it. And you know, the Kala Chakra ordinarily is, 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 is a very elaborate thing. It's a, it's a, a teaching mechanism. You, you make it, it takes days to make it. You make it with little tiny instruments and you, it's precisely done. And then uh, the, the Dalai Lama, it's his, it's his is his thing, will give a teaching, and it will sit there, and then after he's done his teaching, then, then it's virtually destroyed and put into containers and, and taken down to the river, in our, in our case, the Hudson River, and thrown into the river for the benefit of all river life. Um, and of course, none of the teaching part went on at the Museum for, for Natural History. Just, just the Kala Chakra itself was, was created. And you went in every day, and you watched these monks work. Uh, for eight hours a day, and then they went home at night, wherever they went. You came back and watched them do it again the next day. And then at the very end, after maybe it was there a week or two weeks, um, they did a ritual breaking apart of it, which all that meant was taking little whisk brooms and whisking it into a, a pile, putting it into a glass container, and, and we all went down in a procession down to the river. So it wasn't the written, but it was real. That's the point I'm trying to make. It was a real thing you experienced, even though it wasn't the, a taught thing. It was valid. <laughs> Everybody involved in, who saw it and was involved in it really was very moved by it. 
uh, so there was that, the, the Kala Chakra. Um, in 1995, the sacred arts of um, Haitian Vodou attracted worshipers to the UCL, UCLA Fowler Museum of Cultural History in Los Angeles. And Sufi devotees came to interact with Saint in the City, Sufi Arts of Urban Senegal in the same museum in 2004. And they came again when it was in, in uh, Gainesville, Florida at the Harn Museum. Obviously, such attempts to accommodate spiritually live art make heavy demands on museums. But the reality is that if you're going to seriously embark on the job of presenting spiritually functional art, non-Western or Western, and Western is a whole other thing, you're going to run up against fundamental challenges to your own conventions. Unfortunately, these ex exhibitions, particularly the series of them at the Museum for African Art, represented a peak of a certain kind of adventurousness that has not been matched in as dramatic a way since. Part of the problem is that the Museum for African Art itself has more or less disappeared. Um, Susan, Susan Vogel left it in 1994, briefly taking a job as the director of Yale University Art Museum. That didn't last long. Before going back to school to study filmmaking. And she has since made some remarkable films uh, on African subjects. In 2002, the Museum for African Art moved from Soho, where it had its home, to a warehouse space in Queens, which is meant to be a temporary, which was meant to be temporary quarters until a new building was constructed on Upper Fifth Avenue. Uh, they, in 2002, the MoMA was also temporarily moving to Queens, and so the African, Museum for African Art thought he would catch the, the MoMA crowd by making them move at the same time. The MoMA moved back two years later to Manhattan, but the Museum for African Art was stuck there in Queens. It couldn't move, it had no place to go. And it got no, no foot traffic. <laughs> Okay, so the construction didn't get, didn't get underway for that new place on Upper Fifth Avenue for many years. Then when it was finished, the building was technically finished, it ran into trouble and has yet to be occupied. It's just sitting there, empty. Meanwhile, however, the museum is organizing occasional traveling shows but has no exhibition presence in its home city. It currently has no director, it has no curator. However, it, I should mention, um, it does organize shows that it sends out onto the road from various places. And one is going to be an opening in New York on April 18th. It's a South African artist named Jane Alexander, a wonderful South African artist named Jane Alexander. And the show is going to be installed in St. John the Divine on the Upper West Side, which, if you, you know, it's great. <laughs> Perfect these demonic figures that Jane Alexander does are going to be in this amazing space. And while it was doing its experimental thing in the 1990s, the Museum for African Art was doing its experimental things in the 1990s, we were also getting same old, same old throwbacks in the big museums. The Guggenheim Museum's 1995 Africa, the Art of a Continent fell into this category, in my opinion. It took us back to MoMA 1935 and the no information, pure form approach with no apologies made. It was a kind of show that should already be regarded as, abs uh, as obsolete, I wrote in my review of the New York Times. Certainly after the work done at the Museum for African Art and elsewhere by that point, the Guggenheim blowout was a huge disappointment. I'll just quote myself here at this review. Um, radically and arrogantly underthought, it takes dozens of individual nations and cultures and jams them in to a sprawling African anthology. It re represents each with a few arbitrarily chosen objects and makes little sense of what those objects might mean. Entire social and spiritual worlds are passed over for yet another hike along the Guggenheim's ramps. Such conceptual failings are especially unfortunate because the show on view more than 500 works, offers jolting, be <clears throat> jolting beauty and intellectual stimulation at every step. And without this art, modern Western art would simply not exist in the form it does. Just visit Picasso and portraiture at the Museum of Modern Art and see its larcenous doses of African influence. But Africa, Art of a Continent, 
which originated in a different, larger version at the Royal Academy of Arts in London last year, seems little interested in refinements of history. Instead, it prides itself on setting a single headline-grabbing precedent as, quote, the first major survey of the artistic traditions of the entire African continent, period, end quote. A number of readers, a number of readers, Africanists among them, objected to my objections. They saw the show as African art's chance to finally be in the spotlight big time. My fear was that the sheer scope and bulk of the show, rather than generate further interest in Africa, would shut it off. In the Guggenheim version, Africa was just as confusing and conflicting and mystifying as the West had always found it to be. No clarifying light had been shed, and, one, and in one big gesture, we had done Africa. The last exhibition that we had on that scale, the short century, independence and liberation movements in Africa, 1945 to 1994, was much better, infinitely better, but very different, as its title suggests. It came to PS1, Contemporary Art Center in Queens, in 2002, it had originally been in Europe. As yet another big chunk of um, missing history that was being put back into the Universal Museum. The show told a story that began in two places at once. In 1903, the Nigerian artist, Aina Anabolu, started painting portraits, portraits in the city of Lagos, adopting a style from European magazine photographs. His portraits were hit with his Nigerian clientele. There was just something about them. They looked African but different, new, chic, modern. They set a style. Suddenly, everybody in Lagos wanted to look like that. Commissions poured in. A few years later, Pablo Picasso was wandering through the galleries of an ethnological museum in Paris, the Trocadero. What on earth, his friends wondered, was he doing in that old place? Picasso himself referred to the Trocadero as, quote, that awful museum. What he was doing was trying to feel his way out of stifling 19th century European tradition and into a new art, an art with some give, some crackle, some air to it. Staying in, standing in front of a vitrine of African masks, he found what he was after. I'm simplifying, but the essentials are true. Picasso invented modern European art with the help of Africa. Anabolu invented modern African art with the help of Europe. Which of the two made the more revolutionary move? In most accounts, Picasso gets the node by default, because Anabolu doesn't exist for Western art history nor does modern African art that followed him. But in the show, that history was there in multimedia format, and not only modernist painting. In films, African leaders dressed in flowing robes and Savile Row suits spoke. Traditional drum riffs mingled with rock and roll on records. In photographs, you show young people dance the night away at the, pepper, at the peppermint lounge in Bamako. Karl Marx and Paris Match, Jean-Paul Sartre and Wole Soyinke were on student reading lists. <clears throat> Modern art in Africa at that time developed less publicly, more quietly, and in several directions at once. Universities offered academic training based on European models. Communal workshops, workshops established by missionaries and emigre artists encouraged a hybrid of traditional and modern forms. A strain of urban popular art flourished, documenting political events, religious enthusiasms, and advertising the latest fashions in crisp, colorful graphic styles. An extraordinary and extraordinarily diverse generation of modern African artists emerged. Short Century had its problems. It included too few women, an old, old story. In underscoring African cosmopolitanism, the show tended to privilege Western over traditional African mediums and art genres. In an effort to avoid primitivizing, it pushed too hard with urban Westernizing. And in the process, in its own way, 
narrowed down the parameters of defining Africanness. This remains a problem, uh, a problem today, I think, still. A contingent of contemporary art scholars, several of them African born, in an effort to promote an image of modern, uh, modern Africa, uh, shun traditional African objects as too redolent of stereotypes. But I don't think that's necessary. I think everything can be brought together. You don't, but that, that kind of division is still going on, but now from the other side. As rich as it was, indeed because it was so rich, Short Century also served as a harbinger of change already in 1902 and 20, 2002 in progress within the field of African art history. Namely, a move away from research in traditional art and toward a focus on modern and contemporary art, often embodied as emerging from the international African art diaspora. So this is a shift now toward contemporary and away from uh, the older art. Uh, various factors were involved. By the 1980s, the great age of collecting classical, traditional material was pretty much over. Africa had been farmed out and people were basically collecting now from other collections within the United States and Europe. Contemporary art, by contrast, was and is available in endless supply. In a globalist market, contemporary and also art also offers the prospect of more and better paying jobs to professionals in the field. Jobs as curators, corporate advisors, auction house experts, and dealers. The age-old scholarly work of teaching is now far from being the only option open to people coming into the field. So I can, this is one reason that the young scholars wanted to uh, stick with the, the new. At the same time, with the shift to modern and contemporary scholarship, we also had a, on the positive side, very positive side, we had an opening up of fresh directions uh, in the study of African art. Subjects that had never been studied before were not now being scrutinized. Photography, film, collecting histories, fashion, and so on. This shift is evident in other fields as well. In the past, where the modern era, era was where research in India stopped, now it's where much research in India begins. Chinese art history, which long doggedly clung to an age-old reliance on connoisseurship and a focus on antiquity, is now absorbing Western social and political theory. The attempt to unite traditional and contemporary remains a source of tension like an identity crisis unresolved. Some scholars continue to decry present-mindedness. They hear a clock ticking and see only the preservative work not being done. Others take a more positive view. African and Asian cultures, they say, volatile and multifarious, are in a state of perpetual transformation in the present, which is always instantaneously the new past. We document the present as it becomes the past. As for your very big museums, they haven't figured out what to do. Residual blockbuster conscious, consciousness has them thinking ancient and monumental. But ancient and monumental are hard to come by these days, even for loan shows. So for a while now, and with some notable except, exceptions, we've been doing not much at all with non-Western art. I'm afraid the critical establishment is not a help here. The multiculturalism of the 1980s and 90s in the, multicultural, in the multiculturalist 1890s, 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s, critics who had no interest in or knowledge of anything but Western art of the present and the immediate past had to do some fast learning. They had to at least feign interest in non-Western material just to maintain credibility. Once multiculturalism went out of fashion, which it has done, everyone, with a sigh of relief, went back to their business as usual. Fashions will change again, and maybe interest will change with it. But knowledge is not being picked up. The New York art world works by consensus thinking. 
week after week, everyone says the same thing about the same few shows, usually very unadventurous shows. Disturbingly to me, young critics today seem eager to be part of this consensus, which is of course, a determined, is of course determined by the market. Cookie cutter thinking is rife. It's hard to imagine what will change this. You can only write about Elena Tsui so many times. Other major museums, our major museums certainly don't seem ready to be rocking the boat. The Museum of Modern Art's current big Inventing Abstraction 1910 to 1925 show is a throwback to an earlier day. The show tweaks Western abstraction a bit in what I consider a cosmetic way, but its title is false advertising. Abstraction was not invented in Europe. It can be found in every period and culture from Paleolithic, Paleolithic forward. It's everywhere in the art of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Native America. MoMA had an opportunity with this show to write history and point the way forward for itself as an institution. Instead, it stuck to the out-of-date playbook. What gives me tremendous hope is Africa itself, where I recently, I recently visited. It turned all my expectations upside down. It challenged my habits of thinking, which, which meant my way of seeing the world, which meant it changed my life, which is what I'll talk about tomorrow. But one last thing before I close. Like the Museum of Modern Art, Harvard too has a chance to write history. Right now the fog is closed and under renovation. What better time to submit its institutional thinking to revision? Some years ago, the museum had a bright, progressive moment when it hosted an amazing show of Malian portrait photography and a very smart thematic installation of African objects called Marking Places, Spatial Effects of African Art, which was put together by a graduate student. There was talk at that time of establishing a permanent presence for Africa at the Fog, where it would join Italian Renaissance sculpture in Impressionist painting and Western modern art. The plan for that permanent presence didn't come to pass. I understand that the new fog will have a gallery set aside for rotating displays of non-Western art, i.e. primitive art. Please give me a break. <laughs> this is the chance to create a truly universal museum, to get Africa into the mix and keep it there full time, along with the arts of Islam in the 21st century. <laughs> It's got to be there. The, I speak to the fog directly. You've been a timid, conservative institution as long as I've known you. Now more than 40 years. Now is the time to change that. You have the art to do it. You have the brain power and energy to do it. In the person of Suzanne Blier and Mary McWilliams and various other people, including your graduate students, your remarkable graduate students, you have tons of them. Now you just need to get the will to do it. Yale did it. All the world, or a lot of it, under one roof. So I say to the Fog and to Harvard, do it. Go global, write a new history, make me proud. Thank you. That was fantastic, just wonderful. Oh, thanks. And um, well, what would you reckon? We've shown you our, the space for our new Cooper Gallery, which of course will be integrated in the larger Harvard Art Museums. What's your advice to us and um, uh, our re uh, relationship to the fog? I don't, I, don't know what your, I don't know what your relationship to the fog actually is, but I think you're, what I saw today and what I've been told is gonna to be happening there, it sounds like absolutely the right thing. It's gonna be not a, a collection gallery, but it's going to be um, up to the minute stuff. Artists invited in to create art and conceptual pieces and so forth. I think that's the way to go. Nobody else is going to do it. So, yeah. It's the least we could do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes. Um, wait for the mic coming over there. 
Oh, I'm glad this guy, yeah. Hello, my Hi. name is uh, Jason. I go to the museum school. Yes. I just wanted to ask you, because I'm a young artist and i um, embarking upon a career where uh, critiques and critics are becoming a larger portion of my like landscape. So I just wanted to see how to take it because um, like the primitivism, it's like uh, listening to your lecture today, I remember that, like them referring to most of black art as primitivism or primitive in the 1980s. So there's a part of me that feels like, like somebody like John michel Basquet that was the number one word that was used around his work. But then people later found out that he was like well read. So how do you, how do you, <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to give something and nothing to, to these critiques. Because it seems like you have to let people in, but at the same time, like if you let somebody in at the wrong point in time, it could, like if some if he had listened to a critic, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. He would have been really discouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the sense of when to pick up the conversation and how to have it. Yeah, Jason, did, did you were you here yesterday? Jim? Yes, I think yes, you sir. you asked me a question yesterday. Yes, because I thought about your question after. I didn't give you I'm a good answer. I ask you a question every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I I thought about your question last night because I hadn't given you a good answer in, in here yesterday. And the question you asked yesterday was about the old days when there was a WPA to support the arts, and yeah. now what, how do artists get support to do their work? And you know, I thought afterward that one crucial thing is to um, stick with your fellow artists. Yeah. Make a, a community of your own. That's really gonna be important to you right. and to them. Um, because you'll be your support system. You can show each other. Uh, you can develop without in, with interchanging things. But that's how I would, I would. That's the networking I would do would be with other artists first before anything else. All right. Yeah, it's Thank really you. and and in terms of um, keeping you uh, mentally fit and so forth. I think yeah. that's really important. The critiques, I don't know. I mean, they're just a drag. I'm sure. You know, <laughs> frankly, well, I, you know. I'll just share something that somebody, a uh, 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 New York art critic said about my work last semester, because I found it to be humorous. Um, he said, if this was 1970s, you would be prolific. <laughs> I thought that was uh, uh, interesting, yeah, you know, yeah. an interesting comment. Helpful? I don't think so. I, I don't know. You know, and that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. how do you give something and nothing to the critics, um, critiques? Because I, I feel like as an artist, you have to have some type of wherewithal to kind of go against the texture of society because that's the norm. The, the, right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I agree completely. Stick with your friends. Stick with your friends. Yeah. First of all, thank you again. This was really stunning. Um, I was in New York in the same period, 1980s, early 90s, and a question related to that time that I'm just interested in your take on it. On the one hand, what you're fo you focus on two elements. But one is the time, multiculturalism, key events, Rockefeller collecting, the Met, in part, in large measure, because it was Rockefeller opening up their doors, uh, Susan Vogel, an array of different people. So, so basically, the time versus the individual, those factors at play, and obviously they work together. Um, now we're in the uh, new millennium, complications, issues about financing at the federal, the state, the local level, individuals, collections, museums, petting. It's a, it's a different era and a complicated one which can provide um, opportunities great new opportunities as in the new gallery that's going to open here. How do you, in your mind, sift through and uh, negotiate around the question of the circumstances, the era, the 1960s and 1980s, which is part of what you've been talking about, versus and or versus the individual, yourself, the Susan Vogel, the Robert Ferris Thompson, and others? How do you see those as both a part and as factors together? Mm. Um, it, it, the uh, part of the multiculturalist um, 
uh, the 1980s, early 1980s and early 1990s, multiculturalism, that, that blossoming, it was a, quite a blossoming, I felt. It was um, economic because the, the economy had, um, was doing very badly. So you really had to get imaginative to, uh, you were encouraged to get imaginative because you didn't have the bucks to spend on big things. So you had to just do it on your own, you know. So you ought to quote like, you know, Andy Rooney, whatever that is, you quote, make a show. And they did. Um, and now there's just tons and tons and tons of money around. And there was not a market of the same kind at that time. Now there is one, and it's making decisions kind of remotely away from everything else. The market's doing its own thing. I mean, nothing you do is going to affect its decisions. So, and that it puts a, uh, a different, um, uh, I, I think it affects the quality of art that's coming out now. It's, uh, it's not very interesting, in my opinion. Most of what's going on in Chelsea is not very interesting. Um, people aren't taking chances. Um, I don't know much more what to say about that. I mean, I, I, I see just myself coming into this, so I, I'm who I am and carrying this through different decades, you know. But uh, yeah, I'm sure it's a, it's a study that could be done. Questions, comments? Yes, Jason. <laughs> well, did anyone else first before? We'll get you we'll get back. Yes, I, I promise that I didn't want to ask you a question today. Yeah. But. Um, I, I, I was so uh, inspired again for your talk, and specifically with your mention of the role of Thomas McEvely mm. in really reshaping the conversation. Mm. Uh, in this room, there are many of my students. And for the last 17 years, I have been told then Thomas McEvely. And how important, specifically how important he has been in redefining, uh, from my point of view, the discourse of painting, and how much of a art that is coming from Africa and other parts of the world has been so important. And I made a list of artists, meanwhile, you were talking, just in the top of my head, from Chris Ophelia to Kerry uh, uh, James Marshall to Michaelena Thomas to Kara Walker to Ensebu uh, Malanguatengwa to um, Cherry Samba uh, to Malangatana. Uh, all these artists uh, that are so important that he championed, but he also, uh, in one of his articles, I believe that is the monochrome icon, he referred to painting, Thomas McEvely. And he said, my class is here, they, don't know, they know that. They say, painting return with a vengeance. It return in rags. It return like a whore. And what he was meaning was, it return different. It return with a language that have a different textuality. So my question <laughs> goes, to say, um, from your point of view, the re rethinking, reconsidering the role of African art or no Western art have led the past to a new way of reading textuality into art, meaning surface, meaning construction of, 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 of meaning, construction of, a, of signifier. Uh, and in, I'm thinking in those artists that I mentioned, for instance, you know, Chris Ophili using cheat to make paintings, uh, Michaelena Thomas using uh, beads and, 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 and craft material to make art that I don't want to define as high or low, but I want to define as wonderful. Mm -hmm. So how much you see of that? And my other question is, in your perception, Magician de la Terre, uh, Magic of the Air was a very important show. For me, it was an introduction, for instance, artists such as Esther Malango, no? Uh, Esther Malango in the proximity of somebody as um, Sol Luit, no? Mm -hmm. What reference are there to abstraction? How in the Endeavelle society, abstraction is a rite of initiation for the women, and, but very similar. So how do you see uh, the conversation of the importance of African art redefining the discourse for contemporary practice in Europe versus America. And thank you. Yeah, I wish it had. I wish it had more presence um, in than, than it does have. In fact, it's very few people talk about it. Tom was one of the very few writers who, who wrote about that, and he was one of the very few to, you know, the death of painting. <laughs> 
Right. And then he just flipped that around in a very interesting way that by saying, well, it did die, but now we're going to resurrect it in a different way. So we're not going to resurrect it like Greenberg way. We don't, that those days are over. We're going to do something new with it. And we're going to infuse it with all these other elements that was, were never there before, impure elements that were never there before. And that's what it's going to be good for from now on. It's going to be as a vehicle for carrying all these, these new things, including African influences. Uh, at the moment, you know, people have deserted that idea. They're, they're back to formalism, Greenbergism, and all that sort of thing. So we've kind of retreated a bit on that. Um, his voice is not being heard. I don't think people are reading that book of his on painting anymore. We have to do that you. Good for you. I love it. It's a wonderful book. It's so smart and uh, ri rich. Just opens all doors. You know, it's wonderful. Um, but it's not. It's not the moment. Is not receptive to to him. I believe. Um, and that didn't answer your question. But I've. It's okay. All right. <laughs> um, Holly, let me, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that all right, Suzanne? Suzanne and I once had a, an argument about Picasso and African art. And I... You did. Uh, <laughs> and I teach this every year. And I say that, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, very traditional to just dismiss what Picasso did as an act of appropriation or exploitation mm. in certain quarters. Mm. Particularly, not yours, but ideological quarters that would just... But I say, no, no, it was um, the most profound sort of influence is if you can change the way a person sees. Sure. And that's what happened that rainy Sunday day when he stumbled into that closet at the Trocadero. Right. And he was African art. Through African art, he reconfigured how he represented the human figure. Hmm. African-American artists, however, in the Harlem Renaissance, which is what we were talking about, never, ever were able to use African art in such a profound way. African art remained at the level of adornment. Some cowrie shells. They, they engaged in African, uh, um, African American primitivism mm -mm. in their appropriation, attempts to appropriate African art. They never got it. Not one African American artist in the Harlem Renaissance, which I date to the 20s, was able to reconfigure the way they saw the human form through African art. That's my opinion. I'd like to know, I'd like your confirmation in front of everybody that I'm... <laughs> it's a great argument. We never had it. That's bullshit. You were drunk. You were drunk. Anyway, go ahead. I'm staying out of this. I don't uh, No, no. I'm paying for dinner. <laughs> Anyway, what, forget Suzanne. Yeah. We never talked about the African-American part, but we did oh, argue okay. about Picasso. Okay, yeah. What do you think about your, in your knowledge? So you agree with that? He never really, I mean, he didn't find African art in the Trocadero. Yes, he, he did. did. No. no bullshit. He found it in uh, the, the mask and everything right there. Of course he did. Anyway, no. let the man, the, we got the white man in here. Let him answer the question. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, a couple of things. Okay, go no, ahead. Uh, I think the more important, I think I don't have any problem with Picasso's um, Good. Uh, in, ingestion of African art, and it, that's not the problem for me. The, the problem is nobody looks at what, what African artists were doing. And right. I think that, that's where, the, where things have not to be looked at now. That's the yes. important thing. Oh, absolutely. And what they're, how, they are ingesting, how they are ingesting African art themselves and... and and Western, and Western, precisely. Yeah, of course. And making this amazing, uh, I mean, you can't even begin to, to say, but it's just these amazing var variations and, uh, on this whole thing. So that's really the field of interest to me. Picasso, yeah. I don't care about, frankly. I just don't. I and, mean, you know, our first show will probably be Pigozzi's collection of contemporary African art. What are you going to do with that? We don't know yet. We'll are you going to say? You going to say? You're going to talk about it though? You're going to? You're not just going to put it in the walls, right? No, of course not. Because that's what they did at the Museum for African Art, uh, 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 in Nat National Museum of African Art in, in Washington. They brought that collection in, they put it up, and they didn't say one word about problems with that collection. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll talk yeah. about it at dinner. We Suzanne? should. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, great. It's like the, all of this discussion. Let me just go back to your point. I think you raise a really critical issue, and it goes back, I think, in part to. The World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. 1893. And, and I, you know, it's that, it's that really difficult point about Africans were so dehumanized 
in the U.S. and elsewhere through the slave trade, through Jim Crow, mm. through that whole era that I think my, my belief is that for African Americans to turn to Africa at that moment in time as a source of renewal, of uh, critical engagement was, was a leap too far. Of course, it comes back later with Bearden and others. Right. But, but I think that at that moment in time... Well, you're absolutely right about that. And in fact, Locke says famously, uh, Alain Locke, whose lectures you're giving, um, said uh, in an essay in 1925 to African-American artists, you must turn to Africa like Picasso did, right? Because he thought it was ugly too, but Picasso legitimized it for him. But he said, because you must be modern, and by being African, you're being modern. It's a very interesting formulation that it wasn't African art per se, African art qua African art. It was this is your entree to modernism, and your only ticket out is to be modernist. And this is the route that has been paved by Matisse and Picasso, et cetera, et cetera. So, and you're absolutely right. They thought African art was ugly and that Africa was a bad place, man. Just what, like white what people did. some of them did do, in part coming through the WPA and in part through the Mexican muralists, mm -hmm. is to think about the larger tradition of popular art that's coming through the Americas, which makes sense. I mean, Europe, France in particular, had a colonial legacy. All those objects arriving was a very different situation here. Sure. Anyway, let's sign Colin Carter for a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. Good man.